Hello and welcome back to the Oncology Brothers podcast. I'm Rahul Gosain and I'm here with my brother and co-host Rohit Gosain. This time we're excited to bring you the highlights from the ESMO 2024 focused on breast cancer. Thousands of abstracts were presented here, but we've picked three key studies that can impact our current practice in the community. To guide us through this data, we're thrilled to have none other than Dr. Paulo Tarantino from the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Paulo, thank you so much for joining us. Hello, Rahul. Hello, Rohit. Such a pleasure to join you and discuss this abstract. Well, thanks, Samish, for joining us from Italy, Paulo. Another exciting ESMO in the books here. Uh, we'll start off with focusing on three important abstracts from ESMO 2024 in breast cancer space. First of all, Natalie trial, we mainly updated results, which recently just got FDA approved based on off the study as well. Then we'll dive into another standard of care practice, which is Keynote 522 perioperative pembrolizumab approach in triple negative breast cancer. And lastly, we'll touch on intracranial activity of TDXD based on Destiny Breast 12 study. Let's start off the first one, Natalie trial. Before we dive into any further, let's talk about, a bit about the study design. It is slightly different than Monarch E, which was based on uh, abemocyclib in adjuvant setting. So absolutely. Just like Monarchy, this was a phase three trial, um, basically trying to show if utilizing a CDK46 inhibitor in the adjuvant setting rather than in the metastatic setting, we could actually prevent some recurrences, improve outcomes in patients with early stage, non-metastatic or monoceptor positive or to negative breast cancer. And But differently from Monarchy, Natalie included a different agent, of course, ribocyclib, combined with an aromatase inhibitor, whereas in monarchy you could have either an aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen, Natalie included a much broader population because monarchy was restricted to not positive patients, whereas in Natalie you have both patients with not positive disease or also high risk, not negative disease. High risk defined as grade three or grade two and a high evidence of high risk based on Ki67 or Oncotype DX. And interestingly, the, the dose that was chosen for Natalie of ribocyclib is lower than the one that use, is utilized in the metastatic setting, most likely to, to reduce the, the risk of side effects with adjuvant ribocyclib. Finally, I will mention one, one important difference. Um, Monarchy utilized adjuvant abemocyclib for two years, whereas in Natalie, adjuvant ribocyclib is given for three years. So all, all in that, basically, Natalie was assessing with three years of a reduced dose of ribocyclib added to an aromatase inhibitor can improve outcomes in patients with ear positive or to negative breast cancer, with the primary endpoint being invasive disease-free survival. Paulo, thank you so much for laying that foundation, because now we do have these two drugs available. Rohit, you mentioned ribocyclib was literally approved days after the data was presented at ESMO 2024, where we saw improved invasive disease-free survival. Paulo, can you walk us through what do we see at that four-year mark? And importantly, what does it really mean for our patients? Are you going to offer this to all your patients that are node negative? What about the patients that qualify for both ribo and abema if you have node positive disease? Absolutely. It was so interesting to see such a, a fast approval. Well, expected somewhat because the data yeah. we saw at ESMO was very nice. And in truth, we knew already that statistically, adjuvant ribocyclib improved invasive disease-free survival, but at this update of the data after, four, after yeah, four years, basically what we wanted to see is if there is a carryover effect after all of the patients had discontinued adjuvant ribo, and that's the case, because at this update, all the patients that either completed or discontinued adjuvant ribocyclib, and also we wanted to see what was the delta of benefit in patients that receive RIBO compared to those that did not receive RIBO. And basically we saw that at four years, there was a delta of about 5% in invasive disease-free survival. So what you see that at four years, 88.5% uh, per, of the patients that received RIBO compared to only 83.6% that did not receive RIBO were free from a, mostly a recurrence. The IDFS event includes other events, but these were mostly recurrences. And when we looked at distant disease-free survival, you see that most of these were distant recurrences, metastatic recurrences. And, and so we know that preventing those can really have an impact on patients' survival. And, and, and this is why we expect that this 5% delta 
in invasive disease-free survival, very similar data in disease in distant disease-free survival will in the long run translate in more patients being cured from their disease and having improved survival. But in order to, to see an overall survival advantage, we have to wait a very long time. And this is why the FDA has approved this drug, and I think it makes sense to utilize this drug in clinical practice. Although, of course, as you mentioned, there are two drugs now approved in this setting. And in truth, abemocyclib, the Moraki trial, has a longer follow-up, has got more years after, of follow-up after all patients have discontinued the drug. And so I personally tend still to prefer the use of abemocyclib in patients that have overlapping indication, although ribocyclib has a different toxicity profile and can be also be considered. But for patients with high-risk not negative disease, I do feel that considering ribocyclic is, is, of course, a good option, whereas abemacyclic was never tested in non negative patients. So I would only consider ribocyclic in those patients. It, it does, of course, remain a, an agent with some risk of side effects. We know there are some uh, hepatotoxicity is a risk of side effect, and also you can have cardiac toxicity in about 5% of the patients. And, and also, on the long run, we know they can also have financial toxicities, and so it's important to to discuss this important data, but also to, to understand all of these potential risks and always calculate the risk-benefit ratio and, and, and make also a shared decision-making with the patient when you decide about adjuvant CDKs. Exciting times with two FDA-approved options now in adjuvant settings, bemocyclib and ribocyclib. As you stated, ribocyclib, slightly broader inclusion criteria there in comparison to abema. Abema, in general, has more mature data. Important to address that three years versus two years distinction as well. 